has been a soldier, a writer, a U.S. Senator, Secretary of the Navy, and briefly an aspirant for the 2016 Democratic presidential nomination. He is also, to my mind, the best politician novelist since Brand Whitlock, the early 20th century realist and mayor of Toledo. Uh, parenthetically, Whitlock is in the Holy Toledo Trinity, along with the Tolstoyan mayor Samuel Golden Rule Jones and Jamie Farr. Uh, throughout, his, uh, throughout his writings, Love for Jamie Farr. Throughout his writings, throughout his career, James Webb has explored with gimlet eye and felicitous pen the culture gap separating those who live and work and struggle and love in the forgotten America, people who are anything but deplorable, from the privileged few who run the elite institutions in this country and who send the young men and now young women of the forgotten America off to die in inscrutable and undeclared wars. Webbs is the voice of an intellectual and deeply felt and earned populism whose influences range from the literary historian and football coach Vernon Parrington to the ragged sage of Arkansas, Johnny Cash. He spoke what now seems prophecy when in Born Fighting, his history of the Scots-Irish in America, Webb praised the Jacksonian populace of Appalachia, the Rust Belt, the South, the broad Midwest as, quote, the greatest obstacles to what might be called the collectivist taming of America, symbolized by the edicts of political correctness. And for the last 50 years, the left has been doing everything in its power to sue them, legislate against their interests, mock them in the media, isolate them as idiosyncratic, and publicly humiliate their traditions in order to make them, at best, irrelevant to America's future growth, end quote. They're not so irrelevant now, are they? If anyone happens to be looking for a Secretary of State or Secretary of Defense, uh, the two best candidates are in this room today, Andrew Bacevich and James Webb. <laughs> I give you our keynote speaker, James Webb. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's a, it's a pleasure to be with, with all of you today and uh, also to be here in support of the American Conservative Magazine, which I think is one of the fine uh, magazines, thinkers magazines in the country today. Um, and I'd like to thank Bill Kaufman for, for that introduction. And I, will, I promise you that he has not read my speech because I, there are a few things he said that I actually want to talk about today. Um, also, I don't know if anybody has mentioned this or not, but this is Bill Kaufman's birthday. Uh, so. Happy birthday, Bill. You know, this conference is, is about foreign policy, but the, the reach of the American Conservative Magazine is far broader than that, and with what has happened in our political system over the past year. So I, I think uh, we should start with this. Uh, who were the uh, so-called deplorable people who repudiated Secretary Clinton's insult and put Donald Trump over the finish line. Um, Bill mentioned uh, a little bit about this in his introduction, to my surprise. But what were they thinking? And someone who unsuccessfully contemplated the presidency from inside the Democratic Party, let me give you a conclusion and some thoughts. The basic unavoidable conclusion is that for a very long time, both parties abandoned the hardworking people out in flyover land who have done so much to make this country great. And it took an outsider, whatever his wealth and lack of government experience or credentials, to speak the truth, unencumbered by the boundaries of political correctness and the need to grovel before millionaires in order to finance an election. I attempted to do this as a Democrat, I quickly learned the power of pay-to-play, political machines in an era 
where it takes either a billion dollars or a lot of luck on social media. And with few exceptions, we know in this country that a hardwired elite now controls or dramatically influences our media, major media, our financial institutions, and in many ways our political system itself. You know, I look back on the turning points in this campaign, I think of a great friend of mine, a fellow Marine named Mac McDowell, who served in my company in Vietnam, and in fact we were wounded on the, on the same day. Mac was very loyal to me, even though he was a, a conservative Republican. He runs a gun shop and a shooting range in Erie, Pennsylvania. And when I decided not to uh, continue the uh, attempt to, uh, at the presidency, he sent me an email. He said, this guy, Donald Trump, he says, the Republicans hate him, the Democrats hate him, the media hates him. I think I found my guy. So I would like to salute Donald Trump for his tenacity and for the uniqueness of his campaign. Our country is deeply divided and will remain so for some time, but hopefully the results of this election will provide us an opportunity to reject a new form of elitism that has pervaded our societal mechanisms. This is not quite like anything that has ever faced us before in our history, at least in my reading of our history. It has many antecedents, but the greatest barrier, even to discussing it, has come from how these elites were formed, largely beginning in the Vietnam era, and how their very structure has minimized the ability of the average American even to articulate clearly and to discuss vigorously the reality that we all can see. Part of it was the Vietnam War itself, the only war with mass casualties, 58,000 dead and 300,000 others wounded, where our society's elites felt morally comfortable in avoiding the draft and excusing themselves from serving. As I wrote of a Harvard-educated character in my novel, Fields of Fire, Mark went to Canada, Goodrich went to Vietnam, everybody else went to grad school. This created among our most well-educated and economically advantaged a premise of entitlement that poured over into issues of economic fairness and obligations to less advantaged fellow citizens. I know many of you know uh, the writings of uh, writer and lawyer Ben Stein. Years ago, he wrote of his years at Yale Law School with Bill and Hillary Clinton, quote, that we were supermen, floating above history and precedent, the natural rulers of the universe. The law did not apply to us. The uh, second impact was the Immigration Act of 1965, which has dramatically changed the racial and ethnic makeup of the country while keeping in place a set of diversity policies in education and employment that were designed under the 13th Amendment to remove the badges of slavery for African Americans, and this is a policy that I have always supported and continue to support, the African American Affirmative Action Programs. But this policy, designed to remove the badges of slavery for African Americans, was gradually expanded to include, to include anyone who did not happen to be white, despite vast cultural and economic differences among whites themselves. More than 60% of immigrants from China and India have college degrees, while less than 20% of whites from areas such as Appalachia do. That to be white in the law and in so much of our misinformed debate is to be specially advantaged, privileged, as the slogan goes, while being a minority is to be in the law disadvantaged. Frankly, if you're a white family living in Clay County, Kentucky, the poorest county in America, whose poverty rate is above 40% and whose population is 94% white, wouldn't this concept kind of tick you off? Wouldn't you see it as reverse discrimination? And wouldn't you hope that someone in a position of political influence might also 
see this and agree with you? And part of it, finally, is that diversity programs, coupled with the international focus of our major educational institutions, have created a superstructure, partially global, that on the surface seems to be inclusive, but in reality is the reverse of inclusive. Every racial and ethnic group has wildly successful people at the very top and desperately poor people at the bottom. Using vague labels about race, ethnicity, might satisfy the quotas of government programs, but they have very little to do with reality, whether it's blacks in West Baltimore who have been ignored and left behind or whites in the hollows of West Virginia. Behind the veneer of diversity, there is an interlocking elite that has melded business, media, and politics in a way we never could before imagine. And many of these people also hold a false belief that they understand a society with which they have very little contact. And nothing has so clearly shown how wrong they are than the recent election of Donald Trump. How wrong are these elites, at least as it relates to the rest of the country? Look for a moment at the most glaring foreign policy failures of the past 15 years. <clears throat> Ask yourself, how could one Republican presidential administration have made such an incredible strategic blunder as the invasion and occupation of Iraq, only to see the next Democratic administration make an equally grave strategic blunder at least as bad and possibly worse by initiating, initiating what was called the Arab Spring, unilaterally intervening in Libya and instilling an inflammatory foreign policy concept known as humanitarian intervention, giving a president, any president, the power to unilaterally intervene anywhere under the euphemistic rubric of responsibility to protect. Responsibility of whom? To protect whom? At whose risk? And at whose benefit? And the answer is that in too many cases, the masters of our foreign policy decisions are no different, not only in foreign policy, but in a large percentage of the issues that face the country. I'll give you an example. I was very proud of developing a policy where we were able to open up the military junta that was uh, governing Burma and to bring Burma, now Myanmar, back in from, the, in from the shadows into a, an expanding uh, program that eventually, I think, will bring us a democracy. I had visited Burma uh, as a private citizen before I became in the Senate. When I became to the Senate, and I, when I started in the Senate, I got my staff together and I said, we are going to focus on changing the relationship, strengthening our relationship in Korea, Japan, Vietnam, Thailand, Singapore, and to change the formula in Burma. Um, we figured out a way to do that through intermediaries. It took seven months. We started this before Barack Obama was elected and before the so-called pivot to Asia had begun. Um, I was the first American leader to visit Burma in 10 years. I was the only American leader who ever was able to meet with the uh, leader of the military junta, General Tan Shui. I met with uh, Adal Aung San Suu Kyi at the same time as well. And so we began a process where Burma was opened up. After I left the Senate, um, a prominent think tank here hosted an evening dinner on the future of Burma. On one side of this table, there was the ambassador to Burma slash Myanmar back for a visit. On the other side was the Southeast Asia expert from this think tank and us other people, and some of us who had participated were around the table. But the ambassador started off with, with this comment. He said, you know, uh, if a Republican was president, he pointed to the individual sitting across from him, if a Republican was president, you'd be sitting here and I'd be sitting there. There's really no difference in terms of how the foreign policy uh, programs were uh, to be looked at other than the titular notion of 
which party you were in. Um, the Democrats, the Democratic Party, unfortunately, uh, with respect to these issues, moved away from working white people. Uh, the, what the party, the party of Franklin Roosevelt, uh, that had championed the rights of working people, the party that was my grandmother's, uh, Franklin Roosevelt being my grandmother's favorite politician, the individual that pulled my mother's family out of poverty after my grandfather died and after three of seven siblings that my mother had had died in childhood of childhood disease and had opened up an ammunition factory in North Little Rock where my grandmother got a job making artillery shells. That party uh, descended from the party that had championed the rights of working people regardless of race, creed, gender, or any other differentiation to the point that it made white working people their most convenient whipping posts particularly white males. It's clearer now than it was 10 years ago when I was trying to put this on the table. When I was running for the Senate in 06, we had a, uh, that's what they call it, a uh, candidate school. The Democratic Senate Campaign Committee had us come up to Nantucket, and they got those of us who were candidates and talked us through how to, how to appeal to different sections of the electorate. And they got to white working males, white males. How do we get the white male vote? And they put up this legislative uh, item, this, this bill, that bill, you know, minimum wage, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, I, I listened to this, and I, when, when they were done, I said, you know, look, I, I, I was in the Reagan administration. You know, I'm a, I'm a Reagan Democrat. I, I know how the Republicans are approaching this. I know how you're trying to approach this, but here's your problem. White working people don't vote for you because they don't think you like them. And that became clearer and clearer uh, over the past 10 years. In October 2004, I wrote an article for the Wall Street Journal about the Scotch-Irish. Bill kind of alluded to this uh, in his introduction, calling this group white working people the Republican Party's secret weapon. And in the last article, that article, uh, the last paragraph of that article, I wrote, the decline in public education and the outsourcing of jobs has hit this culture hard. Diversity programs designed to assist minorities have had an unequal impact on white ethnic groups, and particularly these, whose roots are in a poverty-stricken South. Their sons and daughters serve in large numbers in a war whose validity is increasingly coming into question. In fact, the greatest realignment in modern politics could take place rather quickly if the right national leader found a way to bring the Scotch-Irish and African-Americans to the same table and so to redefine a formula that has consciously set them apart for the last two centuries. I believed this was impossible. As I said, I grew up as an admirer of Franklin D. Roosevelt. I ran for the Senate as a Democrat concerned about our society's drift toward a permanent aristocracy and believing that the Democratic Party could be rebuilt along the lines of inclusion, bringing white working people back within its ranks. Instead, unfortunately, after the election of Barack Obama, who could have been that figure, I will say, the reverse happened. I mean, think about this. Thomas Jefferson, Andrew Jackson, were long regarded as the founding fathers of the modern Democratic Party. Across the country, the most celebratory dinners every year were what they called the JJ dinners, the Jefferson Jackson dinners, in honor of the author of the Declaration of Independence and the up from nothing American frontiersman who created the very notion of bottom up populist American style democracy. By the sixth year of the Obama presidency, the Democrats were changing the names of the dinners as if ashamed to be associating with the legacies of these two great Americans. Actually, just today in the newspaper, uh, there was a, an article about how uh, 
the president of the University of Virginia, Teresa Sullivan, uh, was admonished because she had sent a post-election letter out to the UVA community quoting Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> he gave them their school. <laughs> so this is sort of Orwellian to me when I look at it. How you, you, you can't constantly reinvent your history in order to shape the issues of today. And, and frankly, it, it's bad for the country, and I worry about it a lot. Um, so let's just talk about how this relates to foreign policy, because it does on a fundamental level. It's no accident, as I said, that a large percentage of the Republican foreign policy elites objected so strongly to Donald Trump's candidacy by endorsing a Democratic candidate who was the wrong side of, on the wrong side of almost every single issue over the past 15 years, but who was considered to be a part of the revolving door structure of the establishment. That's done. We're now facing four years or more, depending on how the country reacts to a Trump presidency, where we are going to be divided, but in terms of our foreign policy, this is an opportunity to reshape our national strategy in a way that otherwise has not been possible. The basic elements are really not that difficult to define. We need a clear statement of our national security and foreign policy. This has not existed since the end of the Cold War. An understandable statement of our national security interests is the basis of any, nation, any great nation's foreign policy, clearly understood principles and the determination to stand by them are essential to stability and to public support. Our allies will be able to adjust to our clarity. Our adversaries will know that we are serious and our people will understand the logic of our place in the world. We don't have that now. Our foreign policy has become a tangled mess of what can only be called situational ethics. And, and in fact, when I was a chairman of the East Asia Subcommittee on the Foreign Relations Committee in the Senate, I held a whole hearing on situational ethics. Uh, how can you have one set of standards with respect to democracy, openness, and openness to the media for a Burma and not apply the same standard to a China? Uh, what, what is it that the United States truly believes and what will we do in order to communicate that to the rest of the world? So tell me what our national interest is, how we are going to defend it, how we will know we have accomplished our mission, and if you can do that, you have a strategy. Once the Cold War ended, we lost our way, and we ended up and continued to be, tra continued to be trapped in this never-ending, ever-changing entanglements, particularly in the Middle East beginning with the Pandora's box that was opened with the invasion of Iraq and continuing through the illogical and still fermenting nightmare of the Arab Spring. I was one, obviously, who warned before the invasion of Iraq that our entanglement would destabilize the region, empower Iran, and weaken our influence not only in the region but in other places as well. The historical record is unfortunate but clear regarding the, this invasion. I don't need to um, expound on it in greater detail today. I do want to take some time, though, to discuss the implications of the intervention in Libya. It became sort of a sad allegory of everything that has been so wrong for America in that part of the world. No direct national security interests were involved in Libya. No American forces were at risk. No treaties were in play that could have called for our military action. Senator Bob Corker and I tried many times without success to call for a floor debate on this in order to force the Senate to vote before the president would take any action. The Republicans did not want to debate it because Senator McCain and some of his colleagues were adamantly in favor of military action under any circumstances. The Democrats didn't want 
to debate it because President Obama was facing re-election within a year and did not want that on the table. And so the Congress dithered. The president intervened. The result was a disaster. The action led by Secretary Clinton and approved by the president is one of the most serious failures in recent American history. And its implications have largely been ignored, other than the inevitable tra tragedy at Benghazi, which took so much of our time uh, and the media's time during uh, the last campaign. How bad was this intervention? Let me read a couple of paragraphs from a special study that was completed by the Kennedy School in September 2013. The this is quotes, the conventional wisdom is wrong. Libya's 2011 uprising was never peaceful. Instead, it was armed and violent from the start. Muammar al-Qaddafi did not target civilians or resort to use of indiscriminate force. Although inspired by humanitarian impulse, NATO's intervention did not aim mainly to protect civilians, but rather to overthrow Qaddafi's regime, even at the expense of increasing the harm to Libyans. Point number two, the intervention backfired. NATO's action magnified the conflict's duration about sixfold and its death toll at least sevenfold, while also exacerbating human rights abuses, humanitarian suffering, Islamic radicalism, and weapons prolif proliferation in Libya and its neighbors, read, among other places, Syria. If Libya was a model invention, then it was a model of failure. All this was clear before the intervention even began. Senator Corker and I, among others, a few others, uh, discussed this again and again during hearings. Uh, I on the Armed Services and Foreign Relations Committee and Senator Corker on Foreign Relations Committee. Uh, and in the short term, right after Muammar Gaddafi was assassinated, Secretary Clinton gave an exultant CBS interview, triumphantly <laughs> announcing, we came, we saw, he died. And front page coverage in the New York Times regarding the creation of a new strategic doctrine for the use of American military force. Looking to the future, what should be our overall governing principles? First and foremost, if a president wishes to conduct offensive military operations, he or she should be able to explain clearly the threat to our national security, the specific objectives of the operations, and the end result that they wish to obtain. Second, we will and must honor our treaty commitments. But we're not obligated to join a treaty partner if they elect to use force outside the direct boundaries of our commitment, as in Libya, which was a NATO fig leaf operation. Neither the United States nor NATO has the power to bring the United States into an elective war without the consultation and the consent of the Congress. Third, it's imperative for the United States to maintain superior, superiority in our strategic systems. That goes unsaid, but it needs to be resaid. This includes not only nuclear weapons, but also areas such as technology, space, and cyber warfare. Fourth, we'll preserve and exercise the right of self-defense as guaranteed under the international law of the United States, of the United Nations Charter. Fifth, we have important allies around the world. Some of them aren't treaty allies, others are, especially in Asia and the Middle East, whom we will continue to support in many ways. This should not cease. In fact, as we clarify our commitments, these relationships should be strengthened. Six, with respect to the war against terrorism, we will act vigorously against terrorist organizations if they are international in nature and are a direct threat to our national security. This includes the right to conduct military operations in foreign countries if that country is unwilling or unable to address the threat. As I said, we have this right under international law and through Article 51 of the United Nations Charter. And in a thumbnail, our greatest strategic long-term challenge 
Military, economically, and culturally is our relationship with China. This is made more difficult because our two countries operate from dramatically different political systems, which is a, a point that's rarely made when we have discussions about trade and other things. Our greatest day-to-day -day challenge here at home, cybersecurity in every manifestation and also the security of our borders. Our greatest day operational challenge for the United States military, strategic deterrence and counterterrorism operations. With respect to Russia, briefly, they intend to remain an historical power. They have been an historical power. In no foreign policy area is it more important for us to communicate our national security concerns clearly and to work towards solutions that at a minimum reduce and de-conflict de and de-conflict our operations. With respect to NATO, I've talked about the importance of our treaty alliances, but just a comment, NATO expansion since the end of the Cold War uh, has created a new environment in terms of how the NATO actually works. Uh, part of this is geographic and part of it is terms of membership. Many of the new members who've joined NATO since the end of the Cold War are clearly protectorates uh, rather than allies when it comes to traditional strategic doctrine. And this creates a new set of challenges for the United States because Article 5 of the NATO Charter requires us to uh, militarily defend any NATO member under attack. We should never undersell the importance of our security alliances in Asia. They are crucial. First of all, China is clearly attempting to slice off one country at a time in its bid to expand power in the region. Our country has served as the indispensable guarantor of stability in East Asia since the end of World War II. Northeast Asia is the only place in the world where the geographical interests of three historic powers intersect, Russia, China, and Japan. Our fourth hand in that historical, uh, I was going to say conundrum, but this historical revolving uh, power uh, alignments, our fourth hand has stabilized the region. Southeast Asia, particularly the South China Sea, where China has over the past three or four years begun militarily uh, strengthening different islands and asserting its sovereignty, is by far the busiest commercial seaway in the world. And we must be there in terms of counterbalancing. We're the only country that can counterbalance China's steady militarization. With respect to Syria and the other countries in the Middle East, these things have been going on over there for a long time. And I'm going to finish my remarks with a, an advice I got from a sergeant in 1983. And I was uh, covering uh, the Marines in Beirut for the McNeil Air News Hour. We're out on a, an outpost and up on top of a, the roof of a building. In front of us, there was a Druze uh, position. Underneath us was a Lebanese army position. The Druze and the Lebanese got into one of these like intramural firefights, one of these arguments shooting back and forth. The Lebanese soldier was shot. The Marines took some rounds. The Marines started shooting back. Um, so we had the Lebanese, the Druze, the Marines, and then we had one of these militias, we didn't even know which one, started joining in uh, over at one side. And then the Syrians came over uh, on a ridge line and according to the Marines were shooting at us with uh, 25 millimeter machine gun rounds. It was sort of a free for all and the sergeant I was laying next to underneath this wall said, sir, never get involved in a five-sided argument. <laughs> Every time I look at what's going on in the Middle East, I think of that sergeant. Thank you very much for having me today. Thank you for your patience as I start. And I think we have time. Uh,
have time to take a couple of questions if you like. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, thank you for coming to us. Um, number one, uh, you mentioned some of the foreign policy failures of the Obama administration. Would you include among those the overthrow of a legally elected government in the Ukraine in 2014 when that government could have been voted out by its own people the next year? This was instigated by the U.S. State Department with Victoria Nuland, the uh, uh, Assistant uh, Secretary uh, for Europe and North American Affairs, w marching around Maidan Square, <laughs> handing out cookies to the uh, protesters. Well, I don't, I don't have a comment on that. I mean, I, I, in terms of uh, wh I, whether or not this was an intentional act of the, uh, the uh, Obama administration. I think it pretty obviously was. Thank you. Thank okay, you. thank you. Uh, Senator Webb, I want to thank you. Uh, I worked proudly in your Virginia campaign. Uh, my thank name you. is David Hoffman, and I happen to be a vice president of the Women's National Democratic Club at DuPont Circle. Men can be members, too. And what I want to do is invite you and others uh, here, because John Henry, who's in the back of the room, from the Empire Salon has written a play about these very subjects uh, called Arguing with God, and the Washington, D.C. premier will be at the club on Tuesday, November 29th. There are flyers in the back. Okay. Thank, thank you for that, and one thing I never do is argue with, with God, because I know I'm going to lose. <laughs> Uh, thank you, uh, Senator Webb. I've been a fan of yours for uh, many, many years now, going back well, probably to when I was a teenager and you were in the Reagan administration. Um, I, I wonder if you could speak, since you uh, have such a focus on the challenge uh, China poses in the long term uh, as well as in the short term to the United States, on uh, the work of Graham Allison uh, and his notion of the, Th the Thucydides trap uh, and the great difficulty that a status quo dominant power has dealing with a rising power that has every incentive to challenge the, the terms of the international system. Uh, can you just speak to uh, his thesis and, and what your view is on that? Well, I, I can't speak to Graham Allison's thesis, um, but I have been warning for more than 20 years about the implications of Chinese expansionism in this region and further uh, if we don't properly address uh, the need for stability in this part of the world. And if you look, for instance, let me give you two, two uh, island issues that I think clearly demonstrate uh, what the Chinese are looking to do in the long term in the region and what the implications are. The first is the Senkaku Islands which are between Taiwan and Japan, but actually are very close to Okinawa, uh, which, you know, the, the Ryukyu Islands, and which the uh, Chinese have never recognized as being a sovereign part of Japan. And the other is further down in the South China Sea, the militarization that, that has taken place, uh, particularly over the past four years. These are clear indications of expansionism, and we have been moderately... Uh, responsive, but not in a way that I think uh, is, is going to need to happen in the future. In the Senkakus, um, when I was in my final debate when running for the Senate in October of 06, I was uh, running against an individual who was an incumbent. He was on a foreign relations committee. We got to ask each other one question, so I asked him, what do you think we should do about the Senkaku Islands? And there was this like silence. And then there was a, up, like up there where you see those lights, there was a press box and I could see all the computers going on, you know, the Google hitting, what's Senkaku? You know, how do you spell <laughs> this thing, you know? But it ended up being the number one uh, foreign policy issue in Asia, in, in, in Pacific Asia in April of 2010, uh, when the, the Chinese uh, directly challenged uh, the right of the Japanese to administer these, the, these islands. And I said at the time, this is not about some rocks out in the middle of nowhere. This is eventual sovereignty issues with respect to Okinawa and how China sees its role in, in the region in the, in the future. 
Um, they've done the same thing in the South China Sea. They created in, in 2012 a new prefecture, like a state, uh, called Sansha. They opened up an administrative base in the Paracel Islands, which Vietnam claims, by the way, among, among others. Um, they have been militarizing uh, islands off of the coast of the Philippines, and they're saying, this is China. You know, you, you know and if you don't like it, then you don't understand history. That's their point. But it's clearly the kind of expansionism that creates problems down the road if, if people don't, if, if governments with military systems like ours do not respond. China will only deal with other countries in the region in a bilateral way. One thing that I was pushing very hard for when I was in the Senate was to try to bring China into multilateral solutions in that part of the world, whether it's Mekong River, uh, which is a, you know, a really uh, terrible long-term issue for uh, Vietnam, uh, Thailand, the southern end of the Mekong, 70 million people are at environmental risk because of the dams that the Chinese are building, whether it's that or whether it's out here in the, in the South China Sea. So I haven't read Graham Allison's thesis, but uh, it sounds like he and I would, would have a lot of points of agreement in terms of what we need to do in order to, to meet the uh, challenges and still have the relationship that we want long term with China. Thank you. Good afternoon, Senator Webb. Thanks for being here. Um, in your book, A Time to Fight, you articulated four problems that you suggested um, represented the greatest challenges to America's future. Um, many of the comments that you made today, I think, parallel or reflect those four challenges. Um, you later in the book articulated this idea that America, and I want to make sure I have the words correct, that America today, it seems, is overwhelmed by vagueness. Uh, there's a lack of confidence, a problem of identity, et cetera. Um, I think many of us in this room might, I know I certainly do, feel that uh, your words are accurate. And I'm wondering if you might be able to suggest ways that the new administration may be able to move forward to help us remember who we are as a society, as a nation state, and to, uh, in essence, clarify the vagueness. Well, thank you for that. I, one of my greatest concerns has been what has happened to the teaching of our history in our public school systems. Uh, and if you, you know, going to the point that you just raised about vagueness and understanding who we are, if you don't understand the facts of our history, how can we have these debates? And how can we come together and understand collectively what, what has made America? I'll give you a, uh, a, a small example of that. The, the history of the American South, you know, it's, it's, it's almost impossible for us to talk about the slavery issue and these sorts of things uh, because it's so contentious. And, and, uh, and yet, um, if you look at the history of the American South, um, I, had a, I had a high school junior visit me a couple of years ago, and she was studying this in, in high school, and, and I said, how are you studying? You know, what, what do you where are you? And she said, we're studying slavery in the, in the Civil War. I said, what percentage of the whites in the South do you think owned slaves? And she said, all of them. And I said, how about 5%? 25% uh, had anything to do economically with the system. That's by John Hope Franklin's numbers, the most eminent black historian. Um, she said, I'm going to go into class on Monday, and I'm going to tell my teacher that. And I said, no, you're not. <laughs> You know? And if you can't discuss facts, how can you understand your history? Um, and if, if there were one thing I would wish is that we could, we could talk more openly uh, to each other about where the divisions are. We're so, so divided. And you saw this on, on this last election, too. Uh, does, uh, does an administration have a role to play? and trying to help us. I would hope so, and I would, you know, I would put that on to the leadership of the administration. I mean, we, we see this problem. How do you have, how do you have this discussion? Uh, how, you know, there, I want to have it. I've said things here today that, you know, people probably made people squirm in their seats a little bit, but you've got to be able to talk about it. Um, if you can't talk about it, how can you come to understanding? Yeah, thank, thank you. you. 
Hi, Senator. I believe it was in a March interview where you shot down the possibility of voting for Hillary Clinton, uh, but left open uh, the chance to support Donald Trump. So I'm, I'm sorry, I, I can't hear you. Say I believe it was in a March interview that you said uh, you wouldn't support Hillary Clinton uh, for president, and you kind of left open uh, the possibility of supporting Donald Trump. So I'm curious, uh, who did you support in uh, last week's election? I was on uh, Morning Joe on March the 3rd, I remember it well. And I was asked a question by uh, Willie Geis about foreign policy. At that time, there were, I think, six Republicans still in the race. And um, he said, you know, I have a, you have this broad experience in, in foreign policy. What do you think about the candidates? And I said, well, look, there's only, I'm quoting myself here. I said, there's only one candidate in the race who has uh, foreign policy experience, and she's been wrong on every issue in the last 15 years. And he said, well, given that, would you vote for her? And I said, no. And then I could say, I didn't want some guessing game going on. What are they going to do? Go down the laundry list and give me all the six Republicans, whatever. I said, look, I'm not endorsing anybody. I'm just, I'm just saying, you know, that uh, if you are going to vote for Hillary Clinton, uh, you're it's predictable. You know what you're going to get. If he, he, he mentioned Donald Trump. I said, well, the Donald Trump could be really good, could be really bad. I'm not endorsing anybody. And I did not endorse anybody during the campaign. Did you not vote? And my, my vote's my business. <laughs> this is America. Hi there. Uh, see, since you seem to be a favorite, at least among a lot of people in this room, for Secretary of State or uh, Secretary of Defense, I figured I'd ask you, it seems to be uh, out there now pretty clearly that uh, either Mayor Rudy Giuliani or uh, John Bolton are shortlisted for state. And so you just laid out very specific, uh, you know, foreign policy challenges and what the ne next administration should do. And I was wondering how you feel about these two shortlisted individuals, they're not strangers to us. Do you think that they can really uh, take on the challenges that you've just laid out very thoroughly? Well, I think it's premature to, to make a judgment on who, who is even going to be in this next administration. Um, the, the issues that I laid out are pretty similar to issues that I have spoken about for years. And, and the, particularly the, the great concern that I've had is you, you cannot have a, a national foreign policy uh, with the kind of vagueness that we have right now. We need to lay out the last, the last time that we really had a clearly articulated strategy was before the fall of the Soviet Union. That's a long time not to have one. Mm -hmm. That's how we get into these, these situations. Is there some sort of experience, though, that's necessary to go into a role like that? that do you think these individuals possess that? Just, I just don't have any comment on You that. don't have any comment. No. All right, thank you. Hi there. Thank you, Senator Webb. Uh, I'm a lifelong Virginia resident. I, I voted for you uh, in 2008, back in when I think you had a, a victory margin of uh, somewhere around 1,000 votes or, or some, something of, of, that, of that nature. And it was in no small part um, because of your early and strident opposition uh, to the Iraq War. Um, in hearing you talk today, I am wondering if you have considered, uh, at least considered the possibility that when you examine uh, the statements that Donald Trump has made uh, about these interventions back when they were being considered combined with uh, the people that he is surrounding himself in his administration. Okay, I got, I got you. I got you. Now, let, me, let, me, let me just say this. First of all, to explain my view of how this election ran in 2006, okay, uh, we won by 10,000 votes in Virginia. I ran against an individual who had just gotten the highest number of votes for president at the Conservative Political Action Conference here in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. I was 33 points behind when I started running. Okay? And we went from 33 points behind to winning by 10,000. So you could either say we won by 10,000, or you can say we overcame a 33-point deficit to beat an incumbent who may have run for president. That's the way I like to see it. Sure. Um, <laughs> now, um, with respect to who, who was opposed to the Iraq war during that time, I uh, had very strong feelings about the, the idea of invading and occupying Iraq from about the 12th of September after 9-11, because I could hear, 
I could hear the voices in the Bush administration start talking about invading Iraq. I wrote a piece for the Washington Post in September of 02, five months before the invasion. Uh, they titled it, Do You Really Want to Be in Iraq for the Next 30 Years? Uh, but I basically said this would be a huge strategic error. Um, and I, you know, that was a hard, as someone who grew up in the military and, and had a lot of military friends, uh, that was a hard article for me to write because I was basically calling out a lot of people that, uh, that I cared about and respected. And then it, it was, I think, the correct position to take. And, and, and I think it's unfortunate that we, uh, we did that. But I don't know who was where otherwise. I wasn't looking at anybody else at the time. I'm just wondering if you've contemplated the possibility that a Trump administration would be far more stridently interventionist than seems to be. I think we'll have to wait and wisdom. see. I don't really don't want to comment on that. Okay, thank you, Senator Webb. Thanks for uh, taking my question. Uh, my name is Jesse Campion. I'm a uh, military veteran, former uh, infantry officer in the United States Army. Uh, I had the pleasure of uh, working on your campaign from a grassroots level um, last year. Thank you. Um, I was able to return back to school uh, after my honorable discharge <clears throat> to earn a law degree, master's in public administration. I'm currently uh, working towards an LLM uh, in national security law, Georgetown law, all in a bill that, that you championed, and I don't think it's recognized enough um, in America and I think with the veteran community. <laughs> um, I've admired your career for, for years. Um, I think you would make a phenomenal uh, Secretary of Defense um, under the Trump administration. I think you'd strike an incredible balance. Um, and there's been a, an incredible rumor going around that you are being considered for it. Um, I think as an infantryman, um, you would fully understand the plight of the American veteran and American soldier uh, prior to making that decision, sending him over. And from a strategic, long-term, big picture standpoint, I think you would fully understand uh, the U.S.'s role and how we should and should not react with sending troops in harm's way. So I guess I'm going to pose a question. If, if you were offered the Secretary of Defense position <laughs> in the cabinet of President Trump, uh, would you take it or at least uh, highly consider it? Thank you. Well, thank you for your, your service. And let me say one thing about the – that kind of, it's getting to be a well-worn phrase, but one infantry – Better into another. Thank you. I know what you went through. Uh, the GI Bill. I'm very, very proud of what we were able to do there. And I wrote that. I, I was a committee counsel in the House Veterans Committee for four years, right after I finished law school uh, and after I left the Marine Corps. And I wrote this bill after I was elected and before I was sworn in to office. I sat down with with legislative counsel. What I wanted to do was to give the people who had served since 9-11 the same shot at the future that our World War II veterans had. Pay their tuition, buy their books, give them a monthly stipend. That's what we did for our World War II veterans. And every dollar, every tax dollar that was spent on the World War II legislation was returned fivefold by the successful careers that they had. So that was my motivation. And also, it was my idea that we could develop a leadership prototype in terms of how to get things actually done in the United States Congress. I introduced the bill, and it was not an easy lift. The Bush administration opposed this legislation until the day it was signed. I wasn't even invited to the White House when he signed it. Not really that I, that I cared. Um, you know, it's <laughs> hearing from you is what, what makes, the, makes it uh, so special. Um, but we, what I did was I went out and I, I got two Republicans, two Democrats, two World War II veterans, John Warner, Frank Lautenberg, two Vietnam veterans, Chuck Hagel and myself. And we pushed it. And in 16 months, we, are, we were able to, to bring that to light. 16 months in the, you know, in the Senate is a pretty short period of time. So it was a great day in, in my life when that was uh, passed. And I'm, I'm really glad you were able to take advantage of it. Thank you. Good afternoon, Senator Webb. Uh, my name is Thomas Amazo Lorso, uh, alumnus of the George Mason University Shar School of Policy and Government, uh, high school history teacher. And um, your hair was redder, mine was fuller, and former high school teacher of Jimmy Webb, Julia Webb, and Sarah Webb at Jeb Stewart High School. Uh, as far as for teaching, you made a comment about teachers. I have a quick question, and that is simply this. You talked a lot about China. 
um, global, the winds of globalization aren't going to stop anytime soon. So maybe in addition to China, what have we not spoken about today that's on the horizon that's going to be additional challenges for the United States? You know, the, the hardest part about coming and making a talk like this is the old Marine Corps saying, how do you, how do you put 20 pounds of stuff into a five-pound bag? You know, there are so many things we could be talking about. Um, so I'm, sh I'm sure we've missed a lot of things that are important, but I think we've been able to cover a lot of good stuff, too. So, thank you. All right. Thank you again.